Hey friends, it's Jessica from Three Rivers Homestead and today I thought I would talk to you about canning lids. <laughs> I love canning. You may have um, gotten that from a lot of my previous videos. I love to grow food and preserve it and canning is a really fun way for me to do that. The problem is 2020 taught me that canning isn't necessarily the most sustainable or um, self-sufficient way to preserve food because you're reliant on these disposable canning lids that you need to purchase. Now I know there are a lot of people that reuse their canning lids and they have great results and um, you can definitely do that if that's something you're comfortable with. I personally only use my metal canning lids once and typically when I pry them off the jar you can kind of see how they're not completely flat anymore and and just for safety reasons and the amount of time and energy I have uh, put into the food that I'm preserving, I don't want to risk having a bad seal. So I, I typically use a brand new lid every time I can. And so that's a problem when there's a, a canning lid shortage like happened last year. Um, last March or April, I kind of um, knew what was coming. So I ordered a case of Orchard Road canning lids and I got them for about $70 off of Amazon. Orchard Road is a company, um, I've been using these canning lids for years. Azure Standard used to sell them in bulk and they don't anymore, but that's how I kind of got hooked on these. And I got these, this pack, it's um, 12, 24 12 packs worth of um, narrow mouth lids and I got them last April, I believe, for $70, which was a great deal. It was about 24, 25 cents a lid. And that is typically the most that I would like to spend on, on canning lids. My local Amish bulk store sells them in packs for narrow math. You, you used to be able to get them for 21 cents a lid. And I thought that's a great deal. That is a, a good price and, and um, I'll buy those whenever I go into the store. What happened was June rolled around and I went to the store and I saw that they had some canning lids and I bought a couple packs. I went back two weeks later and what they were selling for 21 cents a canning lid had doubled and it was now like 45 cents per canning lid. And as many of you know, this became the issue of last year for many canners. If you could find canning lids anywhere, the prices had doubled and in some cases tripled. So then you're sitting there thinking, is it even worth canning these things when you have, you know, 75 cents invested in the lid? If you have, you know, a pint of um, jam with 75 cents just in the lid alone, plus the cost of the contents, why not just go buy jam from the store, I guess? It really wasn't a cost-effective way to do it. So... For years, I've heard about reusable canning lids, like Tatler is one of the most common brands, and I've been hesitant to try them because for a few reasons. Well, firstly, some of the reviews online said that there is a little bit of a learning curve and that you get bad seals, and I just haven't really wanted to risk that in the past. My second concern with these reusable canning lids has been that they are plastic. And I'm not a huge fan of using plastic on any of my food that's going to be heated. You know, I'll use for, um, we have little plastic snack plates. And if I'm making the kids sandwiches or something, I'll use the plastic, no problem. But there's just something about me that just, it, I don't know. I feel like if you heat food in plastic, that plastic could leach into what you're eating. And if I'm going to all the trouble to can this, you know, organic, homemade, wonderful food, why would I want to use a plastic lid? But then last year happened, obviously, and there were canning lid shortages, and I started to really think about this issue of the plastic, and I did a little bit more research into what Tatler uses for their plastic lids, and I found that it is BPA-free, it doesn't have the, how do you say it, phthalates, um, and other questionable things that you try to avoid in most plastics, um, and what I'd found was that the plastic used in this, as long as you're heating it below, I believe 460 degrees was what their website said, the risk of any toxins um, being released into your food is, you know, not there. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll give them a shot because if you actually look at, let me find a metal canning lid here. I did a little research on those. And despite them being the steel and the tin, they are coated with an epoxy 
on them to prevent rusting um, if you're using high acid foods like vinegars and tomato juices. And so I did some research into this and you know they advertise these cannulates as BPA free. So that means there must be some sort of plastic compound on the coating on these lids as well. So really if I'm worried about the plastic in the Tatler lids, shouldn't I be equally concerned about the epoxy coating on this? It just, I don't know, I guess either way you use canning lids there is a risk of some of that material leaching into your food. So I guess that's the point where I'm at this year. I thought it's worth it to try some of these reusable lids so that if this canning lid shortage continues into this year, I don't run into a problem where I don't have lids on hand. This would be a really convenient solution. So today what I thought I would do is take you along as I try these for the first time. I have never used them and I read a little bit about them last night and I think I have it figured out um, so that I don't um, make the mistake of ruining a batch of precious homegrown food. <laughs> you know I have bags of frozen fruit and frozen tomatoes that are in my freezer because I ran out of lids last year. I was trying to preserve lids and not use as many and I had freezer space so I thought well I'll just freeze these and then maybe as canning lids become available next year, I can process them through the winter. And so I thought about maybe trying these lids on some of that tomato sauce or some of that fruit sauce. But then I thought what would stink is if I do a batch and I mess up and then, <laughs> you know, all of that food is lost. So to preserve my precious homegrown food, I'm just going to try it with some dried beans. And I have done a video before on how I can dried beans and I'll link that below. Today's video is not about how to can dried beans. I just want to show you the process for using the Tatler lids. And bean dried beans are pretty inexpensive and so I figured it's not a huge loss if for some reason I mess this up and these don't seal properly. I'll just use those beans up this week and we'll go from there. So with that said, um, if this is something that interests you and you've been having a problem finding canning lids, but you've been hesitant to use the Tatler lids based on reviews that you've read, why don't I show you how it's done and then you can make a decision on whether or not this would be a right choice for you and your family to use this year. Okay, so I'm gonna get started here. Let's ignore my mess back there. We live here and <laughs> the kids just had lunch and I had a quick moment where everyone's entertain entertained and I could uh, get this video done. So we have to sneak it in when we can dirty dishes or not. <laughs> so the Tatler lids, they come with the plastic lid and they come with the rubber seal. And what you're essentially trying to do is recreate the metal one where the rubber is already attached to the metal lid. Now there are two ways to do this. Um, you can just put the rubber on the lid and sit it on there. Uh, other instructions I saw were to actually center the rubber on the jar like this and then put the lid on top and so that is the method I'm going to go with. What you want to do is make sure that the top of your jar is nice and clean. We're just using water and beans but if you were filling these with something like a jam or a jelly or some kind of sauce or other food that would have a sticky spillage you'd want to just make sure that that is um, that there isn't any remnant of that on the top of your jar. Then I'm going to place my rubber right there. I'm going to place my lid on top and then the metal rings that came with the jars are going to be used. And from what I understand, what I have read on the website is that you, with a reusable Tatler lid, you're not going to want to get your jar lid as tight as you would with a metal lid. So once I get it to the tightness that I would normally can with, I'm just going to go back just a little bit to allow steam to release. And then apparently from what every, all of the reviews and instructions that I've read have said, you can these when they're slightly loosened and then after you pull them out of your can or after they're done processing, you're going to take an oven mitt and go back and now tighten after they're done, tighten the, the ring as tight as you can. So I'm going to try it that way. People that have had seal failures, um, I've read online that it's typically because they tightened the Tatler lids as tight as they would their ball canning lids or other metal lids. So that's what I'm going to do right now is get the rest of these lids on the jars and then we'll get them in the pressure canner 
and I'm going to show you the process for um, tightening them after they're done. All right, got all of the lids on. I'm gonna get them in the pressure canner and get these processing. So while I'm waiting on the canner to get up to pressure, I guess I'll talk to you a little bit about price. I looked it up and as of today, a 12 pack of these lids is approximately $19 on Amazon. And that was the cheapest I could find them. When these were bought several months ago, obviously it was after the end of canning season and people weren't really thinking about it, the price was cheaper. Um, but at $19 a piece, if you're used to getting canning lids at about 25 cents a piece, that just means that you would need to use these six times um, to have them cost the same as a disposable lid and then anything after six times would just be you know free canning lids <laughs> so that is my goal um, every year I'd like to purchase more packs of these in the off season when they're a little more inexpensive and kind of build up a stockpile of them so that in the event that I can't access um, disposable canning lids I would love to have these as a backup Ideally, in the future, these are the lids that I would choose to use for um, foods that don't need to be heated as much. I feel like pressure canning gets things so hot and for such a long time when you're talking about using a plastic lid, that probably isn't your best option. Um, so maybe I will be using these if all works well this summer in my water bath canner for things that don't need quite so long of a processing time. And I feel like this will be a, a good option for us. Once these beans get done, I'll let you know how it went. While I'm kind of babysitting the canner here, I've got it up to pressure. And I'm just kind of keeping my eye on it to make sure that the temperature doesn't fluctuate at all. Um, and then once I get that stable, I can step away. But in the meantime, I need to be in here. So I'm going to get started on making some cornbread for dinner and thought I would share the recipe with you. So why don't I show you that? So the first thing I need for my cornbread is some cornmeal or corn flour. I use whole corn. I buy my whole corn from Azure Standard in bulk and then I grind it down into my own flour. I use, um, sometimes I use blue corn, sometimes I use yellow. Today I'm going to use the yellow and I'm going to put it in my Nutramil. People always ask what kind of grain mill I have. I have a Nutramil and people ask how I like it and I am going to say that this model of the Nutramil is definitely not my favorite. <laughs> I had one of the old models where the canister slides in the bottom of the Nutramil and I loved that one, but unfortunately I put frozen grain <laughs> through it without thinking about it and I ruined the motor of that one. So I got the new model here and it works. It does a good job, but I do find that it spits flour sometimes. So if you're you know, looking for a grain mill, I definitely wouldn't recommend this particular model but it's gonna work for us. I do find that when I do corn, corn is a very big grain. So what I have to do is remove, there's a little piece like this on the top of my mill. I have to take this off to make a larger hole to allow the corn to go through. And I kind of use my hand and I only put a little corn into the top at a time. And, and then it doesn't get clogged with the big, the big pieces of corn. So let me kind of show you that. So my corn meal, corn flour is done. You can see, nice and fresh and smooth. I can't recommend having a grain mill enough. This not only um, cuts down cost because it costs less to grind your own, just to buy the whole grains and um, grind your own than it does to uh, purchase the pre-ground flour. It's also fresher and healthier for you if you uh, do it uh, this way. Uh, another benefit of this is that the grains can be stored long term. You can have the whole corn or the whole wheat berries or whatever you want to grind. Um, in storage 
and then just grind it fresh as you need and it lasts much longer than if I bought a, a huge bag of corn flour. I may not go through all of that uh, before it starts to go rancid, but this way I can just grind up what I need for a recipe and I'm good to go. Um, right, here is my recipe. I'll put it in the description below, but basically I'm gonna double this today. I need one full cup of flour um, one half a cup of sugar, um, one and a fourth, wait, no, one and a half teaspoons of salt, eight teaspoons of baking powder, three cups of the cornmeal, I'm going to do four eggs, and two cups of water. So I'm going to get started adding that in here. I also have some flour that we ground yesterday, so we'll be using the fresh ground um, wheat as well. I do find that when I am using fresh ground flours, you might have to add a little extra flour because your flour is all light and fluffy because it's just ground down. As flour from the store sits in the bags, it kind of gets more compacted. And most recipes are written, written with that compacted flour in mind. So when you do use the fresh stuff, you kind of have to add a little bit of flour. And it's not it's not an exact science, you just kind of have to eyeball it and see how your dry to wet ratio of um, ingredients is kind of coming together. And if you find that it's a little too wet or sticky, just add a little extra flour and it'll be good to go. We are coming to the end of our water glassed eggs. I mentioned in a video sometime at the end of last summer that we were preserving our fresh eggs in a a water and a calcium lime mixture and we did this last year I maybe did seven dozen eggs in here and when we had our egg shortage and our hens weren't laying over the months of December and January these were the only eggs that we had to use in our baking and they turned out to be amazing um, they preserved fine we haven't had any of them that um, once we cracked them open were rotten or smelled bad or anything the one thing I found is that some of the eggs the yolks were kind of runny and some of them they held up firm but I didn't notice a difference in taste or smell from the runny ones versus the firm ones I don't really know what that has to do with but they've turned out great we have maybe three left here in the bucket I'm trying to use these up for my baking here in the next couple weeks because our hens are finally laying again and the timing was perfect I think next year my plan is to water glass way more eggs I'll probably do double the amount that I did because I'd love to have eggs for things like scrambled egg breakfast and things like that. This year we only used the water glass for baking and um, and it worked out so well that I would just love to have more next year. So I can't recommend that enough. If you're kind of on the fence about doing it, don't be scared. It turned out great. Okay, the secret ingredient for my cornbread is pork cracklins. I'll link below the video that I made on um, how we render lard and how we get our cracklins. This is just a byproduct of the lard rendering process. It's basically the same thing as a pork rind. It's the um, skin of the animal with a little bit of the fat still attached and it makes what's called a cracklin. And if you've never had it in cornbread, it adds amazing flavor. Um, so after I make my cracklins, I always stick them in the freezer and this is what I use them for. I just sprinkle maybe um, a half cup to a cup into the recipe, depending on you know how much cornbread I'm making. Since I doubled this today, I'll probably do about a cup of cracklins in here. And then I'll mix that around in there, and it just really adds a nice flavor to your cornbread. Okay, the other secret to really good cornbread is a cast iron pan and lots of lard. <laughs> So once again, see my video on lard rendering if you want to know how we get that, but I'm going to coat this cast iron in a really thick layer of lard. Not only does that prevent sticking, which really isn't too much of a concern if you has, have nicely seasoned cast iron, but that lard gives the outside crust of your cornbread a nice crisp, and that's what you're looking for in a good cornbread. So let's get the lard, and I'm going to coat this up. Thank you. 
All right, so when I said well greased, that's what I mean. I get a really thick layer of that in there, and then I put in my batter. That's what it kind of looks like. Getting the hair out of the way. Now, another thing that is really delicious in cornbread is jalapenos. I even have, I can a, um, it's not quite cowboy candy because it's not gelled. It's sort of like a, a candied jalapeno and more of a liquidy syrup. And that's really good because those are kind of a mix of sweet and spicy. However, um, Adam is home tonight and he's not a big fan of jalapenos, so I'm leaving those out. But that is something you could add to your cornbread. Just chop up some jalapenos, whether they're pickled or um, fresh or even candied. Put that in there and that would be a delicious addition to your cornbread. So we've got it in there. I'm going to stick this in the oven for how long? 20 to 25 minutes. All right, let's see how it went. It's been 90 minutes and my canner came down um, from the pressurization and I'm ready to check and see how these jars look. This is kind of exciting. As per the instructions, I am going to tighten the lids now. Remember that we left them a little looser than usual while they were canning. So I'm just going to kind of use an oven mitt and tighten these so that as the sealing process is finishing, I have a nice um, tight ring on them. I'm finding as I'm doing this that some of them can't really be tightened too much. So somehow during the canning, process, these lids that were slightly loose, these rings that were slightly loose have tightened a bit. So I'm not quite sure what that's about. And then as I'm looking at the lids, they do sort of have um, a pop-up lid in the middle of them where I can see some of them have already sucked down and sealed. I'd say three out of seven so far are already down. Um, three of them are still popped up. So I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign, but we'll let these sit for a little bit. Hopefully the rest of these will pop down and we'll go from there. I'm hoping to have seven out of seven sealed jars, but um, this is my first time with these and you just kind of never know what's going to happen. My cornbread is also done and it looks delicious. That worked great. Let me show you what we're going to serve that with tonight. This meal is a favorite of Adam's. I've got a ham hock in here with some beans. This is a mix of lima beans and white navy beans. And these have been in the crock pot cooking all day long. Um, it's just the ham hock, the beans, some onion, parsley, um, salt, and pepper. And that gives it a really good flavor. And what we'll do is cut a slice of the cornbread, put it in a bowl, top it with some of the beans. I'll strain out some of the liquid so it'll just be kind of beans and meat. And then what we do is we drizzle over top of that with some maple syrup. It's just a really good comfort meal on a cold day. Date. So I had three um, lids that the tops were still popped up when I took them out of the canner and it looks like as of now they have all popped down which means that hopefully they've sealed. Two of them took about 30 minutes to, to pop down and seal. This last one right here took almost two hours but as you can see now this little indent on all of them has sucked down. So what we'll do is tomorrow when we wake up we will test these. I'll take the rings off and we'll see if the seals are good. 
All right, it's the next morning and I'm really eager to see how my jars did. From the looks of it, all of them popped down um, and look like they're sealed, but now I'm gonna remove the rings and we're gonna get an idea of uh, whether or not this little experiment worked. Okay, so uh, for me, this is a success. All seven out of seven of the jars that I did um, sealed, and I tested it by just holding on to the lid. This is how I test my jars, and it looks like all of them are gonna hold. So that is really exciting. Now the true test will be, will these seals remain on the shelves um, for an extended period of time? So I'll have to update you on that later on. But as of now, I'm very excited about this. I do notice that I had some siphoning of liquid out of my jars, which I don't typically have using, <clears throat> using my other um, metal lids. So I don't know if that had something to do with the fact that the lids were loosened a little bit in the pressure canner. Um, I'm not sure if I would have that siphoning of liquid if I were doing it in a water bath with something that didn't have quite so long of a processing time. I'll have to... Um, see and as I experiment with uh, using them on other things but I guess my verdict on the Tatler lids <clears throat> is that um, I would use these again. Um, one other thing when I was doing my research I found that they're called Tatlers because the inventor of the Tatler lid wanted the the lids to tattle on you um, <laughs> when they were or, or to tattle when they were sealed I guess to give some sort of noise or indication that that there was a seal. Um, when you can using metal lids you get a little pop and I guess that would be your tattle or your tell that, that the lid has sealed but actually these don't make a sound so I guess when the inventor discovered that the tattlers wouldn't actually tattle the name had sort of stuck and they they didn't want to change it so um, that is something to consider too when canning with these tattler lids you will not get the ping that satisfying ping noise that lets you know that <laughs> that your lids are working but other than that, um, if you have any questions about my experience using these lids, you can go ahead and ask them in the comments below and I'd be happy to answer. Um, but I'm going to, um, I guess, move on to another project today. I hope you found this information useful and I look forward to uh, talking to you again in the future, friends. Have a great day. Bye.